Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Quest Diagnostics with Covaris launches automated NGS platform, optimizing workflows to maximize lab economics. I am Kaylee Bach of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Covaris. To learn more about our sponsor, visit covaris.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Submit. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. And with that, I'd like to now welcome our speakers. Ryan Serra, PhD, Senior Director of Molecular Genomics and Oncology and Genomic Sequencing Services at Quest Diagnostics Incorporated. Matthew Gallen, MPH, Scientific Director in Research and Development for Quest Diagnostics. And Samir Vastankatar, Senior Manager, Omics at Covaris. Ryan, I'll hand it over to you to get us started. Good day, everyone. I'm excited to uh, take this opportunity through Lab Roots and with Covaris uh, to tell everyone a, a bit about how Quest Diagnostics and Covaris have worked together to launch um, what we believe to be a, a industry-leading, highly automated NGS platform that not only optimizes our workflows, but also maximizes our lab economics. So I'll kick us off. I'll give us a brief introduction to uh, genomic sequencing services and infrastructure services. And then I'll hand it off to Matt Gallen, who will talk about our collaboration and how we've worked with Covaris. And then finally, we'll close out with Samir, who will walk us through the Covaris product line. So as I mentioned, uh, my name is Ryan Serra. I'm a senior director of molecular genomics and oncology. Uh, where I lead the genomic sequencing services and uh, the infrastructure services businesses. So Quest is uh, well recognized as a, as a leading diagnostics provider in the United States. However, Quest is more than simply a lab service provider. Given the scale and the breadth of our operations, we have to innovate at a lot of different levels. As you can imagine, there's really no off-the-shelf solution for orchestrating all the data that we generate. Data and information are really very much at the core of what we do. Uh, therefore, we need to develop world-leading information technology that support all of our testing as well as our support services. In addition, we really try to embody continuous improvement. And for that, we need to have data at our fingertips. We need to have powerful ways that combine and analyze that data for continuous improvement. Not only that, we also innovate when providing quality diagnostic results that are cost effective and accessible through our portfolio of specialized solutions and thousands of test offerings. The reason we get up each morning here at Quest is our shared goal of working together to create a healthier world one life at a time. We understand that Quest Diagnostics has a role to play in developing and delivering affordable insights that empower better healthcare decisions. When pursuing this purpose, we strive to deliver the high quality test services at the lowest cost possible. This level of service should be accessible for everyone. To this end, we've been developed an impressive national logistics infrastructure. We have over 2,200 patient service centers and importantly, 70% of Americans are within an hour's drive of one of our PSCs. These are staffed by over 10,000 skilled lobotomists, and we can further increase our accessibility through our wholly owned subsidiary, Exam 1, that provides mobile lobotomy. Once we collect your sample, we can swiftly move it to one of our 57 licensed laboratories. We utilize, we utilize our own fleet of airplanes, Quest Air, as well as commercial carriers to move your samples quickly to our testing sites. On the ground, we have over 3,000 green vehicles that move the samples from either the PSC or the shipping hub to the lab. 
This infrastructure allows us to meet you where you are and get your sample where it needs to go. For today's talk, we're going to be focusing on genetics and genomics. At Quest, sites that perform genetic and genomic testing are classified as esoteric, high complexity sites. And we're indicating those on the screen here with the yellow bullseye. We have four of these sites globally, and they're located in California, Texas, Helsinki, Finland, and Marlboro, Mass. Much of the talk today will highlight the work that we've been doing in our Marlboro facility. Genetic testing is really understanding how the instructions for the genes inside your body are written. It's estimated that up to 40% of heritable human disease can be attributed to, one, to an underlying genetic defect. And I would say that cancer is a result of somatic or tissue-based genetic defects. The technology that we're gonna to discuss today for reading genes is next generation sequencing or NGS. And what I wanna highlight is that NGS technology has been going through a rapid series of changes lately. 40 to 50 years ago, this technology, such as Sanger sequencing, would allow, only us, allow us only to read very small regions of genes, possibly the entire gene, and eventually the entire gene. As that technology improved and NGS became commercially available, genetic sequencing tests expanded to include panels of genes all the way up to all of the expressed genes or the exome. The first draft of the human genome was completed 20 years ago. And the first clinical genome tests were available about five years after that. However, if you look at this table, you see that the exome is about 40 million base pairs or um, nucleotides, whereas a genome is 3 billion or 75 times larger. Reading a genome comes at a significant cost. And for certain applications, it could be cost prohibitive as shown in this table. However, that's about the change due to the recent introduction of several low-cost NGS solutions. When we think about the high-level cost structure of an NGS test, there's really four broad categories, sample acquisition, sample prep, sequencing, and interpretation and reporting. A couple of years ago, sequencing accounted for the majority of the test cost. As that cost of sequencing comes down, through technological innovation and new entrance into the sequencing instrumentation field, the relative importance of the other cost categories increases. Quest has a distinct advantage due to its scale and those logistics that I highlighted earlier in that sample acquisition category. However, I would say that the trend to lower cost sequencing over the past decade, uh, that we saw this coming and we made a series of investments to better position ourselves. Many of these were geared towards some of those other cost categories highlighted on the prior slide. We started our genomic sequencing services business to, su to support high throughput sequencing customers and drive investments in lab hardware for collection, extraction, and sequencing processes, as well as developing novel software components that enable data management, analytics, workflow logic, and knowledge bases. We also invested in the ability to transform and present that data in innovative ways, uh, depending on who the end user is. We ultimately began to couple these investments with our depth and breadth of clinical and medical expertise, as well as the core infrastructure I highlighted earlier. This all resulted in our capability to offer modular and end-to-end -end genomic solutions to a wide variety of customers. We have spent a great deal of time better understanding the needs of these customers and what drives their innovation and business goals. We soon realized that Quest had a much larger opportunity to contribute to the promise of precision medicine. We came to see that our unparalleled access to patients, our suite of testing services, and our ability to provide follow-up care and services could power precision medicine in ways we previously didn't appreciate. When it comes to patient access, we could offer physical sample collection, the ability to raise awareness around specific offerings, ways to move data to and from our customers through existing connections, as well as ways to tap into our global diagnostic network, or GDN, 
or compliantly access remnant specimens that could all support novel test development or clinical studies. We could go one step further and characterize those samples through NGS-based multi-omics, but also through clinical chemistry or pathology services. And finally, we could provide wraparound or follow-up services to enable a better customer experience or enable better healthcare outcomes. I now wanna highlight a new product that we recently released that embodies much of what this framework was intended to support. So I'm proud to give this audience a brief overview of Genetic Insights, a genetic health screen that analyzes 36 genes for 23 different health conditions. This product really embodies the concept of access through and through. Importantly, this test is available on our website, Quest Health, at what we, what we believe is a cost-effective price of $199. We ship you a kit to your house. We collect the saliva specimen, so it's easy to collect and we re return a result to you in three to five weeks. Importantly, these results come in a variety of different forms that present information in several modalities to account for the differences in how people process information with the overarching emphasis being on comprehension of your genetic results. Importantly, we also emphasize actionability. Our genetic results are actionable, meaning we want to empower you to better understand what your next best step is and how to take it. Speaking of steps, I now want to return to how we built this NGS platform. Our genetics and genomics journey at Quest has been a long road. So sticking to the automobile and road analogy, I've illustrated this analogy using vehicles. In this case, these are all Porsches, believe it or not. We started the same way that many genetic labs do. It's a very manual, hands-on body of work. We built high-end boutique solutions, but we soon found that they just didn't scale up. We made a decision to build a bigger pipe. We optimized for speed, something on the order of 5,000 tests in 24 hours. It was a massive technological feat. However, we very quickly saw that some of, the, some of those inherent trade-offs that come with a design like this, namely that we couldn't make the adjustments easily. So we're now in what we refer to as like our third era of design thinking for, for NGS. And we've built a more open modular design. One in which we can optimize, reuse component parts, develop special implements. And you know, all in all, that's one of the reasons why uh, we, we have the tractor illustration here because of that flexibility in different use cases. So throughout this journey, our thinking transformed and the analytics that we used to measure our process performance similarly changed. We took on more of a manufacturing management mindset and we started to pay particular attention to the precision of individual sub-processes. We observed that small variations early on in the process, they tended to magnify over time, leading to more variability in the final outputs. And this variability led to a more unstable process with more suboptimal results, another, saying it another way, more failures. And so as we increasingly scrutinized our process, we saw the benefit of working with industry leading instrument manufacturers like Covaris to develop new innovation. When we form these close working collaborations, it's important to be selective in who we are working with. We saw early on that Covaris and Quest had and aligned mission, vision, and values. At Quest, we're working together to create a healthier world, one life at a time. Covaris aims to help more people around the world by delivering sample prep solutions that enable better information from biomolecules and improve and save lives. At Quest, we aim to help people to make better, better their best decisions to improve health. And they, we do this through five key attributes or behaviors. Customer first, care, collaboration, continuous improvement, and curiosity are five Cs. Covaris values customer focus, innovation, teamwork, and recognition. So before I hand it off to Matt, I wanted to just say on a personal note, from my perspective, Covaris really has embodied that teamwork with, our, with our, the work that we've done together. There's been consistent trust and communication as we've brought all of these innovations that we're about to tell you about forward. With that, 
I'll turn it over to Matt Gallen. Thanks, Ryan. So I am Matt Gallen. I'm a scientific director in the R&D department within the molecular genomics and oncology segment at Quest Diagnostics. I'm super excited to be here today. And I wanted to start off by really walking through what the historical timeline has been between Quest and Covaris in terms of our collaboration. So about 12, 13 years ago, we started to really dive into our first targeted NGS panel, and we leveraged the original Covaris LE220 sonicator to really be the driving force behind the mechanical fragmentation of that workflow. In between 2012 and about 2017, we launched numerous other uh, varying size panels on NGS that leveraged this same LE220 sonicator. However, that shift in the market that really went towards enzymatic fragmentation is what caused Quest to also make a shift. So we were looking for something that was uh, higher throughput, lower cost. And at the moment for the LE220, it was still on the higher cost and lower throughput side. So Quest had made that shift for numerous other panel launches, including our whole exome offering and our NICU targeted stat panel that really was driven instead of by the LE220, but by enzymatic fragmentation in those methods. We drove those panels and the whole exome product for a number of years. What we really started to understand is that throughput via enzymatics made that whole workflow more complex than we're really where we wanted to go to. And it didn't make it as high throughput as we fully expected when we made that shift to enzymatic fragmentation. So what we started to do is really provide feedback to Covaris. And that's where we saw a, yet again a shift back to Covaris for mechanical fragmentation through the R230. So we started to do more collaborations again with Covaris, leveraging this new platform. We built it onto the side of our Hamiltons. And that's really what drove our initial new product launch of Genetic Insights that Ryan previously mentioned that leverages the R230 on the side of our Hamilton stars. And that brings us to where we are today. When we look at the history of NGS workflows at Quest, we really started off with smaller panels that were driven by this gold standard acoustical shearing method. And at the time, 10, 11, 12 years ago, we were really looking for lower throughput methods that were a part of manual workflows. And the microtubule approach at Covaris with the LE220 fit that perfectly. There was very little complexity with fragmentation and it drove more robust library preparation on the LE220 for those manual lower volume workflows that we had about a decade ago. That shift in the market really in terms of enzymatics and automation over the last four, five, six years is where we saw the shift at Quest to enzymatic fragmentation and away from the more manual, low throughput, high cost LE220. So we made that shift for numerous product offerings on our NGS platform and really drove it for a few years off of enzymatic fragmentation. However, that new need for high throughput, low cost, scalable workflows in a more modular platform approach is where the need for the R230 really came in. So that complexity that was brought on by enzymatic fragmentation very early on in our library prep workflows made it difficult for us to scale. So the engineering solutions that the R230 really helped solve were easier to plug into our modular approach than the complex biology that enzymatics uh, really introduced into our workflows. And that mechanical shearing really decreased our complexities at scale as we build initially from 96 well plates to 3D4 well plates and to higher scalable throughput modules. So that combined shift between enzymatics and automation was really where we provided feedback to Covaris and where they made that shift from the LE220 that was not automatable and was a very high cost over to our now R230s that are linked to a Hamilton liquid handler or additional automation device and have a lower cost. So that automation compatibility paired up with that shift in cost is really that feedback we presented to Covaris and they really addressed those critiques to drive the uh, collaboration once again with their introduction of the R230 device. 
So we now have multiple R230 devices that really drive that beginning stage of our library preparation and decrease the complexity that we saw with the enzymatic shearing. So we now have a lower cost for the device, which for the LE220 was higher than what the R230 is, and those consumables were a much higher cost than what they are today. So that shift from the glass microtubules now goes to the AFA plates uh, that we can use for scale and throughput. So our renewed collaboration with the R230 really uh, integrated that R230 with four key areas as a main target for our new workflows. So like I've mentioned, it addressed our scalability and compatibility through incorporating the R230 into our automation. So now it's a part of our modular approach. It is linked directly onto a Hamilton star and is fully automated for uh, all of our different methods in library preparation. So once again, it moves away from enzymatic shearing back over to the gold standard shearing with the AFA plates. So now there's lower costs, it's highly automatable, and it brings back those efficiencies and decreases the complexity for more robust reproducible assays. Uh, it addressed a lot of the issues that we saw with enzymatic fragmentation at scale, and those engineering solutions were much easier to solve for than complex biological reactions. So not only does it drive down cost, uh, but it really increases and makes our workflows more robust from a scalability perspective, throughputs, and decreases the error brought on by a lot of those complex reactions. And now I wanna shift gears a bit and dive more into some of the data. Uh, so what you see on the screen here was our initial proof of concept studies in collaboration with Covaris that really laid the groundwork and the foundation for incorporating the R230 into our workflows. So both of the slides, both of the plots that you see in front of you, sorry, the Y axis looks at base pair sizing. The plot on the left side looks at the same sample being replicated across an entire plate to understand what that reproducibility looks like. And the plot on the right side dives into a few different aspects of our proof of concept study one being a increase in the length of shearing time and the other being an increase in the volume uh, for our amount of DNA being sheared. And what you can see is within each of those different groups, it is very precise in the uh, fragmentation sizing. And you can see that it's very tunable as it grows across uh, the time setting, but there's really no shift from a volume perspective. So it, it really makes the initial fragmentation within our workflows be tunable and scalable and amendable to a lot of different specimen types that might come in at different volumes, different concentrations, and it really helps to increase the robustness of our workflows. Like I said, this was really the basis of our initial proof of concept studies that drove a lot of our downstream work and incorporation into all of our workflows. So taking a step further, all the data you see on the screen here is really from our development and a production for that genetic insights assay. So on the left side of your screen, there's a comparison that I wanna to touch on first that really looks at the breadth of the distribution for enzymatic fragmentation versus mechanical fragmentation. So that yellow portion uh, is for enzymatic fragmentation and you can see the wide distribution laid out by the number of outliers in that box and whisker plot. And in blue next to it, shows a much tighter distribution for mechanical fragmentation. While we're still working to increase the sample size through the new R230 workflow, what it really shows is a vast difference between that distribution of fragment sizes that we know have a direct impact downstream in our sequencing reaction. That plot right in the middle is really taking into account multiple plates and what the variation is across multiple plates for insert size. So it's very little variation and you can see slight shifts by plates and it might have, uh, it does have to do a little bit with specimen type that you see on the right side of your screen. But what you can really see is a very tight insert size distribution for where we target within our methods. So with these, uh, with the shearing methods being more tunable, we're able to understand exactly what the parameters are to get it into a very tight window for insert size. And if you look on the right side, this is incredibly important from a Quest perspective. 
uh, and clinical utility across all of our product offerings. You'll see that across different specimen types that include uh, prenatal samples for cultured amnios, whole blood and saliva, but then we also add in buccal sponges and cord blood, it shows that the insert size across those different, different specimen types is very equivalent. So it means we can have multiple input specimen types into our workflows, and there won't be a wide amount of variability that we had seen in the enzymatic fragmentation reactions that make it much more robust for multiple inputs, different patient populations and clinical utilities, uh, and it makes our workflows in general more robust at the very start that impacts the downstream sequencing reactions. So a lot of this data was really that step above our initial proof of concept studies that drove the validation of all of our workflows into production because of the data that you're seeing on the screen. This next slide starts to dive into to at least a piece of those uh, big impacts that the initial fragmentation has on sequencing. We know that when you look at hybrid capture uh, NGS workflows, the fragmentation upfront has a direct correlation into the enrichment after your hybridization. And what we look to do by pulling this data is really understanding, especially in, co in comparison to the enzymatic fragmentation data you see in orange, that mechanical fragmentation data showed a 3x increase in fold enrichment upon sequencing than what we saw for enzymatics. So this really shows us that that more stable starting point in our workflows drastically increases our performance downstream. And what it does is increase our targeting. It makes for more uniform batches, which improves our multiplexibility through our workflows and on our sequencers. And it ultimately lowers our assay failure rates and decreases our turnaround time for getting our results to our patients. So across the board, this has a huge impact from a laboratory perspective, a perspective um, from an economics perspective, that really works to improve the performance of our workflows uh, dramatically. What I now wanna do is switch gears and show a video of the R230 incorporated into our workflows on our Hamiltons. So what you'll see here is the R230 incorporated on the right side of our Hamilton star. You'll see that the Hamilton takes that plate that's on deck moves it over to the R230. It's a, a sped up version, but what it does is really go through the entire method on the Covaris R230 as a part of the Hamilton program. That arm will then take that plate back off of the Covaris, put it right back on deck, and it can continue past that step into other steps of the workflow. Lastly, I wanna to touch a bit on some of the shifts that we've seen from a Covaris perspective that really are integral parts of our collaboration. So like I mentioned before, that shift away from the LE220 that drives more towards a plated AFA approach, what it does is now it no longer means that we have the AFA fibers of the past, where those would clog into your liquid handlers. It's much easier to pipette into those plates than it previously was with the glass microtubes. They come unsealed, so we can leverage our own seals. We can use pierceable seals if we need to, but it, it really increases the uh, ability to incorporate these onto our automation. They are thermal cycler compatible, so we can take the plate that comes off the R230 and put it directly onto a thermal cycler, which makes the cost of testing overall, instead of switching to multiple plates, drives that cost down. There's the options for automation lids that make that sealing not necessary. So it really increases the robustness of our workflows. So we're able to incorporate it for DNA and RNA shearing. Uh, and as I said, we have launched it in 96 wall formats, but we're currently in development for additional formats that would continue to increase the scale and the throughput of all of our workflows because of the critiques that Covaris really took to heart, made changes with through the R230, and really helped us to build our new modular approach with the R230 linked into our Hamilton Starks. So with that, it concludes my portion and I will turn it over to Samir. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Kelly, for the kind introduction. Also, thank you, Ryan and Matt, for the wonderful and enlightening presentation. 
My name is Samir Vasan Gadkar, and I am the senior manager with Omics Solutions team at Covaris. It gives me immense pleasure to present today alongside both Ryan Serra and Matthew Gallen from Quest Diagnostics. I would like to take this opportunity to provide a brief background about the Covaris technology platform and share its capabilities. In today's talk, I would like to start with introducing the Covaris technology, followed by sharing its features and benefits. I would then like to follow up by sharing some examples of the capabilities of the Covaris technology and how it can benefit the NGS users. Towards the end, I would like to provide a summary of our current NGS solutions. So let me start by sharing the Covaris vision to help more people around the world by delivering sample prep solutions that enable better information from biomolecules to improve and save lives. So Covaris Adaptive Focus Acoustics Technology, or AFA in short, offers high value solutions in the pre-analytical sample prep domain. Our technology enables highly efficient extraction and processing of biomolecules from a whole range of different sample types. This processing is done in a very robust and reproducible fashion that enables streamlined workflows across different omics pipelines. So how does it all start? It all starts with the use of a high frequency ultrasonication AFA method for delivery of acoustic energy in a very focused manner. This is a non-contact process which eliminates any chance of contamination. The AFA process is extremely tunable and thus offers significant operational flexibility. The entire process is conducted in a thermally controlled environment, thereby ensuring integrity of the biomolecules. So all the different configurations and the superior results that AFA offers allows the user to fit all the puzzle pieces together by offering a single technology platform that allows for high quality performance, low cost per sample, as well as the versatility needed to accommodate all current and future needs. The high quality data output from the AFA process helps provide deeper insights, be it in oncology with germline and comprehensive genomic profiling workflows or biomarker detection, drug screening or pathway analysis. All these insights lead to actionable data that helps in improving and saving lives. Starting with the features and benefits of the AFA technology, the AFA technology platform uh, is compatible with a lot of different input sample types and offers a universal sharing platform for whole genome sequencing, whole exome sequencing or targeted panel workflows. It offers a streamlined workflow with standardized protocols, and this is especially very helpful when dealing with a wide range of input sample concentrations where the processing can be done with the same protocol. The tunable process allows the user to generate fragment sizes across a very wide range while ensuring great repeatability and reproducibility throughout the process. The high quality sequencing data generated with AFA sharing allows for robust germline or comprehensive genomic profiling analysis while ensuring cost savings. The AFA technology is extremely scalable and automation compatible, thereby easily meeting current and future high throughput processing needs. So because of all the benefits the AFA technology offers, it is considered as the gold standard when it comes to DNA sharing for NGS. Just to highlight a few examples here, uh, in the first plot in the top, the uniformity of the fragment traces is shown when working with different input amounts with the same standardized protocol. This offers immense flexibility and minimizes the whole optimization that might be needed when dealing with different input amounts. In the second example, the plot in the center of the uh, slide shows the tunability of the process, wherein fragment sizes are generated across a wide range uh, with different protocols. In addition to this, 
The unbiased sharing and a tight distribution allows for uniform genome coverage and does not exhibit any GC bias. Earlier in the webinar, Matt shared very nice sharing distribution data across multiple sample types with the Covaris R230 instrument. This particular example demonstrates highly repeatable, reproducible, and overlapping sharing performance in 96 well Covaris plates across different instruments, namely the R230 and the LE220+. The same high quality performance is delivered across all Covaris instruments. In addition to the 96 well plates, we also offer sharing protocols for 3D4 well format. In this example, robust sharing data for 200 base pair and 500 base pair is demonstrated and protocols are available with low volumes using the 384 well plates. This solution further helps in enhancing high throughput processing capabilities. Continuing with the scalability aspect, AFA solutions offer different consumable format to address different sample processing throughput requirements. This easily allows users to develop workflows with current throughput needs while retaining the flexibility to increase throughput without any compromise in performance. In addition to this, the increased throughput can be easily coupled with integration platforms to further minimize touch points, lower the turnaround time, and achieve economies of scale. The Covaris R230 instrument can be easily accommodated in either on deck or deck at different configuration based on liquid handler workflow requirements. The Covaris instruments are compatible with a wide range of liquid handlers and offer flexibility to users when choosing an integration platform. It was great to see the superior results Matt showcased in his talk earlier wherein the AFA technology allowed for better targeting, more uniform batches, and lower assay failure rates. The better uniformity, lower duplication rate, and better target coverage results in high quality data. Lower assay failure rates and better on target performance with streamlined workflows lowers the need for resequencing and the results in lower cost per sample. In addition to this, Compatibility with the wide input range, ability to process different sample types, coupled with the scalability and automation of features, offer a great deal of versatility. Overall, the AFA technology offers excellent quality, high throughput capability, and a cost-effective solution for genetic research and diagnostics. I would like to share highlights from a similar study done with the R230 that was integrated on the Hamilton setup, wherein few hundred samples were analyzed. In this study, greater than 98% sample pass rate was observed, thereby demonstrating a highly reliable workflow. All the sequencing metrics in terms of mean coverage or percentage duplicate reads or percentage of reads on target, on target easily surpassed QC thresholds. This high quality performance and streamlined workflow greatly helps in ensuring lower cost per sample. In the end, I would like to conclude with a summary of existing solutions in terms of the different consumables, instruments, and sample automation compatible platforms that are listed here. Covaris offers robust sample prep solutions across a wide throughput range and we are always happy to work together with our partners to generate streamlined workflows. Please feel free to reach out to Covaris application support for any specific inquiries. With this, I would like to thank you all for your time and attention. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you, Ryan, Matthew, and Samir for your informative presentations. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. So if you have a question that you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. And we'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. All right. So let's get started. Okay. Our first question here asks, 
Can you tell us some more about what technology changes have happened that is driving the explosion in NGS testing? Sure, I can take that one. Um, you know, I've been in the space for about 20 years now. Um, and, I, and I firmly believe that there's never been a more exciting time to be involved with next generation sequencing. Um, there's been an explosion in uh, a lot of different new technology platforms. So there's, there's recently been a lot of um, high profile new entrants into the sequencing instrumentation space with the, the entry of the UG100 from Ultima Genomics, um, complete genomics with their T7 platform for high, high throughput population genetic screening. And, um, and then, you know, a lot of innovation at both the optic and the chemistry level when we think about, um, you know, Pacific Biosciences and um, their recent acquisition of, of not only um, Omnio, but also Apton um, more recently. And, and so what this has really amounted to is like a lot of new high quality and different um, differential data sets that can be generated from next generation sequencing. And then now you couple that with the explosion in the medical literature around what this, this datum actually means. And uh, we've never been at a more um, critical time in terms of how we bring NGS insights and, and, and really data to the forefront of the medical field. So, um, you know, I'd say there's, there's sort of that, that coupling of both technolo technology and innovation, um, advanced analytics, and then now coupling that with medical literature and, and um, what that actually means for a patient. So that all kind of comes to a head and says, you know, there's there's never been a bigger opportunity in front of us to bring NGS to the masses and really empower better health. Awesome, thank you, Ryan. Next question here, how does a modular and or end-to-end -end genomic capability work? I can take that one. So the way we've built our modular design at Quest is really around specific portions of the laboratory workflow. So some modules will be driven more towards library preparation, some driven towards automated hybridization enrichment. So that way we can really plug and play different pieces across the laboratory workflow based on what our assays are, what our products are, and it makes it really configurable, tunable. We can drive our limb system to really kind of plug in different pieces of those modules for different needs. Um, so it makes us able to scale in different ways that having a single end-to-end, -end, one single system solution doesn't allow us to do. Um, so that's what we found to be much more flexible in terms of a path to validation in the lab and make us able to really scale our workflows in a, a modular way uh, that really decreases the number of bottlenecks we have. Great, thanks, Matthew. Now, Genetic Insights seems like a really powerful tool for managing your health. What conditions are covered? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so Genetic Insights was really formulated with actionability in mind. Um, so, you know, really genes that, that are well established and linked to a number of different conditions um, that are heritable, and, uh, and so the results themselves are very easy to turn, interpret. So at a high level, um, there's a number of different health conditions that, that are covered by the product. Um, and I would encourage folks to check out the, the product page on uh, questhealth.com that, that details this more fully. But at a high level, it's, it's really addressing breast and colon cancer, um, heart and blood health, uh, connective tissue disorders, as well as, well as carrier statuses. Um, some of the, the conditions that are covered as a result of this profile is, um, you know, uh, let's see, cardiomyopathy, um, hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, Lynch syndrome, um, familial hypercholesteremia, um, hemochromatosis, and classical and vascular uh, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, Marfan syndrome, um, Tay-Sachs, and others. So, so really, um, if you think you have a if you're, if you're looking for additional information for both you and your family about any of these types of conditions, um, you know, this is a really great product for that. And again, I, one of the things I would emphasize about the product itself is that it's really geared towards comprehension. So if you do get a result, um, you're going to understand that what that means through a lot of enhanced reporting and a lot of different ways that we can present that data and explain that data to you and your family um, so that you can be empowered in making the best decisions uh, for your health. 
Great. Next question here asks, the gain in hybrid or capture performance is impressive. What other plans does Quest have for utilizing AFA shearing? That's a great question. Uh, so right now we're really focused on leveraging the Covaris AFA technology when it comes to our sub exome hybrid capture based approaches for the current offering of products that Quest has. Um, but I think Ryan mentioned this earlier, our push in the future is really driven towards whole genome testing. So that's really what we're driving towards and having the Covaris be uh, a big piece of that platform, having it be tunable and precise uh, will really help us to scale those whole genome platforms uh, and workflows of the future. Great, thanks, Matthew. Next question, what is the expected resequencing cost savings with Covaris? Uh, so I can take this one. Uh, what we've noticed is is that there's a lot of variability um, and we had a, a higher uh, range of sequencing coverage associated with specific samples on uh, some of the assays that we talked about. So namely the hybrid capture based assays uh, when we were using enzymatic sharing versus mechanical sharing. When we got to, went to the mechanical sharing method um, using Covaris AFA, we were really able to finely tune those those DNA fragment sizes, get more efficient, more uniform capture which led to a more even distribution of sequencing across the um, sample set that was loaded on the flow cells. And, uh, and what that really led to is that the, the samples that were sort of higher relatively to the, to the population of samples um, in terms of sequencing coverage versus the ones that were lower, that was, that was more normalized. And we got lower assay repeat rates as a, as an, uh, as a result of that. So the savings that we saw in, in just that increased uniformity was on the order of, you know, anywhere between five and 15% fewer repeats um, from, from this increase in uniformity. So you then, you can, you can amortize the, the decreased repeat rate across the, the batch of the samples, and then you can come to your, your overall savings. But um, typically what we saw was this, this pretty dramatic reduction in the repeat rate. I should also mention for our friends in operations, lab operations, that this was something that was pretty important because from a workflow perspective, repeats, you know, tend to um, cause sort of a, a, a bottleneck or they, they, they can lead to longer turnaround times and things of that nature where you got to batch a lot of repeats and get them back into the workflow. So by decreasing the, the, um, the repeat rate, we also saw that operational savings in terms of having a more streamlined workflow. Thank you. We're getting some great questions in from our audience here, and we do have some time, so we're going to continue. This next question asks, how does optimization costs with enzymes stack up against that with Covaris AFA? I can take that one. That's a good question. And really, it comes to what the drivers for scalability are, right? So when we look at all of our different specimen types, the ability with the Covaris R230 to put those specimen types on the same plate together and shear them within one method and one protocol allows us to streamline that optimization up front in those library prep workflows. When you have uh, workflows that include enzymatic fragmentation, what we found from a scalability perspective is that different plates, different batches had to have different specimen types. So it really increased the amount of optimization by really driving up the amount of time to try to adjust and optimize enzymatic fragmentation time periods for each different specimen type. So it really drives down that optimization time, labor cost, um, consumable cost to really streamline that upfront piece from a, a workflow development perspective. Great, thank you. Now this next question has two parts to it. And this question asks, why does mechanical show improvement in enrichment in capture? Is this an improvement in coverage by increased insert size or actually a more efficient capture? Great question. It's not necessarily increased insert size. It's more from a uniformity perspective. Um, so we look at having a, a small distribution of insert sizes within your library what it does is it increases the targeting and hybrid capture from the probe perspective. So that way, once you get towards enrichment, it really increases the enrichment washes uh, and drives your overall kind of 
pull down capture across that piece of the workflow. Um, so it's more based on the uniformity and increasing the efficiency of the hybridization and the enrichment than it does from a increased insert size perspective. Great. Another question for you, Matt. How does the cost per sample compare between enzymatic fragmentation and fragmentation with uh, the covaris? Good question. Um, it's hard to put an actual number there. You know, early on with enzymatic fragmentation, we found the initial cost was uh, lower from a reagent perspective in that, that that more complex reaction was really a part of that library prep uh, kit that would come from different vendors. But what we really found during optimization is that it increased the number of batches we would have to build per specimen type. And it also increased our repeat rates at scale. Um, so while upfront, it did look like it would be a lower cost, at the back end, when we put the entire workflow together, because of our ability to scale more efficiently, have more efficient batches and a more robust sequencing, it actually drops the overall cost per sample for the mechanical fragmentation than it did for enzymatic fragmentation. Great. Now, here's another question. Um, why was Hamilton Star chosen for integrating with Covaris sharing as opposed to other liquid handlers? Great question. I know that, uh, and I'm sure Samir can touch on this as well, that the R230 is integratable with a number of different uh, automation providers. Um, here at Quest, we do have different collaborations with some of those different providers. Um, we were really driving our lab workflow protocols through our Hamilton uh, liquid handlers. So it was really an easy transition for us. Uh, we actually first use it as a standalone R230 by itself before integrating it. Um, but it was really a, uh, a decision of our R&D and operations team together to pick that liquid handler. Um, but Samir, if you want to dive into uh, the other possibilities, you know, please do so. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Matt. Uh, yeah, as Matt mentioned, well, Hamilton Star was something that uh, Quest decided, uh, decided to choose and test for their workflow. Having said that, the R230 system is compatible with across a whole range of different liquid handlers, as I mentioned in the uh, talk. So there are options. It can be with Hamilton, it can be with Deacon, it could be with Biomec, for example, could be with Agile and Bravo. So there are a whole range of different uh, platforms. So it's pretty much agnostic to the liquid handlers, and we are always uh, we always look forward to working with our partners if they have a specific liquid handler in mind and enable the workflows on their liquid handler platform. Great. All right, well, it looks like we have time for one more question here. So we'll ask this one and wrap up afterwards. Um, this is another two part question and it asks, how different is the FFPE sample protocol versus other sample types? And does time of fixation significantly change the ultrasonication requirement? Yeah, I can take that one. Uh, th that's a great question. It's kind of difficult to generalize this because a lot of this depends on the type of extraction kit that has been used, the analytical technique used for an, uh, for measurement, as well as the for final fragment size. That uh, the extraction quality significantly impacts the shearing uh, size and the shearing protocol. We do have our own shearing uh, extraction kits that ensure very high quality uh, analytes that are extracted either for DNA or RNA, and that can be used with our shearing protocols to, do, uh, to get the desired fragment size. In terms of the reverse cross-linking question, yes, it does impact and the uh, the degree of fixed material that is left behind can impact the, the shearing uh, distribution. To address that, uh, there are we have the, our FFP extraction protocol calls out for specific cons conditions to ensure good reverse cross-linking, as well as the covarious reagent that is used for uh, the tissue lysis buffer that is used for extraction, contains some proprietary ingredients that en ensures extremely good reverse cross-linking, as well as very robust sharing with FFP samples. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you so much, Samir, for that final answer. And thank you again to Ryan and Matthew and Samir for your time today and your important research. This does conclude our session. So before we go, I'd like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Covaris, for underwriting today's educational webcast. I'd also like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period 
will be addressed by our speakers via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand and Labyrinths will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. So until next time, take care everyone. Goodbye.